So these are three hard acts, <clears throat> acts to follow, especially Stephanie, um, who I have heard talk before, but I think she brings really to life, literally, um, so much of what all of the rest of us are trying to work with and study and understand. But I also want to thank George very, very much for a really, I think, outstanding presentation. Um, and I feel very grateful to you, George, that you were able and willing to come and participate in this event. And Zoe, too, um, I think is one of the most exciting young people <coughs> I've worked with in a long time. So thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And I also want to thank all of you for coming tonight to help us celebrate the launch of what I think is the first ever Center for Complicated Grief, certainly the first ever university-based Center for Complicated Grief. The Center would never have been established without the strong support and dedicated efforts of Dean Takamura and her wonderful administrative team here at the School of Social Work. <coughs> also, our center activities are possible only because of the contributions of a very long list of people who have provided a great deal of different kinds of input. And I could just spend the rest of the time that I'm going to talk to you listing them all. So I decided to, I, I didn't want to like not mention them, but I'm limiting the list to a few of the people who have played an especially important role. First of all, I want to mention Nicole Anderson, who's taken on the full range of activities, administrative activities, that are central to every aspect of our functioning. Bevan Campbell has a leadership role in our new Train the Trainers program. Natalia Skritskaya has provided support <laughs> and input throughout all phases of the center development. Nicole Alston is our community liaison, and her contributions have been very, very critical. And Stephanie has been a consultant to us and a very dedicated member of our team and companion as we've developed this center. Additionally, the intellectual roots of this effort are planted very firmly in the Developmental Psychobiology Laboratory of Myron Hofer, who we're very fortunate to have here this evening, who I first met in the late 1970s, along with Harry Scher and Susan Brunelli, when I worked with them under an NIMH T32 fellowship in Myron's lab. Important intellectual nourishment also came from Grief researchers like George, who I met, um, at least he met, I think, when I first started this work, and whose work has always been very, very important to my own thinking. But also a number of other people, a few of them include Paula Clayton, Sidney Zizuk, Robert Niemeyer, and Holly Prigerson, none of whom are here tonight. And clinical researchers, Edna Foa, Ellen Frank, David Kupfer, Charles Reynolds and Naomi Simon, none of whom are here tonight, and biostatistical colleagues, Philip Lavori, Joel Greenhouse, Naiwa Duan, Melanie Wall, and Yuen Jo Wang. And lastly, I would not have come to the School of Social Work at all if it weren't for the imagination, encouragement, and support of my close friend, Ann Kaplan, who you will hear from shortly. Again, there are many, many others who deserve mention, but time doesn't permit me to review the whole list of people to whom the center owes its existence, because I do want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Why do we need a Center for Complicated Grief? And you've heard a little bit about that already, <coughs> but I'll tell you my perspective. So loss, as we've been saying, is a natural part of life that affects us, I think, in a manner somewhat similar, somewhat analogous, really, to the way that injury or illness does. It disrupts our usual functioning, and it also triggers a natural healing process. George, as he pointed out, and others have taught us that for most people, the disruption is actually not so great. And or we heal 
in a natural environment with support from friends and family without any kind of clinical intervention. Healing after loss means comprehending its finality, understanding all that it means that a loved one is no longer in our lives, and being able to envision a future that has purpose and meaning and the possibility for joy and satisfaction, even though this person is gone. Most of us do heal this way, but some don't. So over the past three decades, we've learned that we can reliably identify a subgroup of about 10% of bereaved people for whom the natural healing process is derailed, as Stephanie so eloquently described. And this is the problem we call complicated grief. And just to be clear about it, we use the term complicated, not in the ordinary sense of the word, but in the medical sense, which refers to a superimposed process that interferes with the natural healing of a, another condition, in this case, bereavement. So my research group has been working since the mid-1990s to develop and test methods for recognizing, understanding, and treating the complicating processes in order to permit natural healing to take over. There's a pressing need to help people with complicated grief. Using the most recent epidemiologic estimates, there are about, <clears throat> there, there are about 10 million people, 10 million individuals in the United States alone who are suffering in this way. So Stephanie is certainly not alone. In 2009, my colleague Naiwa Dwan <laughs> developed a guesstimate, he called it, of the rates and consequences of untreated CG that turn out to fit reasonably well with subsequent epidemiologic findings. According to Naiwa's guesstimate, CG costs our country about $35 billion each year in lost productivity and accounts for about 5% of currently unemployed people. Importantly, too, the lives of friends and loved ones are often very impacted by a person with this problem, especially, again, as Stephanie pointed out, their children's lives. CG has been associated with medical illness, including cardiovascular illness and cancer, and with suicidality. So given its prevalence and impact, we set out to, to develop methods and tools to facilitate clinical work with people suffering from CG. We constructed and validated screening instruments, a structured diagnostic interview, cognitive and behavioral assessment scales, and a collection of forms and handouts for use in a manualized 16-session ses treatment that's been efficacy tested and that Stephanie told you a little about. Our treatment approach is based upon an attachment theory model of bereavement that directs attention to brain circuitry known to be involved in close relationships, as Zoe pointed out. The model posits that healing after loss entails learning and emotion regulation in a process that includes coping with both loss and restoration-related problems in tandem and that proceeds most effectively in the context of strong, supportive companionship. The treatment comprises a set of well-developed procedures individualized to fit the needs of each person. The treatment is structured because we believe structure is helpful to people being assaulted by strong emotions. And it utilizes some simple psychotherapeutic principles that track through the 16 sessions. These include an emphasis on self-observation and reflection, the use of imagery, which fosters implicit learning, especially fosters implicit learning and facilitates emotion activation, and encouragement of positive emotions, which can nurture creativity and problem solving. Signature techniques in this treatment are imaginal revisiting, imaginal um, conversation with the deceased person, situational revisiting, personal aspirations and goals work, work with memories and pictures, and meeting with a significant other. 
We've been funded by the NIMH for three different randomized controlled trials of this treatment, one of which was completed and published in 2005, a second that has just ended recruitment, and a third that is ongoing. Our first study documented CGT efficacy and a dissertation study by Kim Glickman, a PhD candidate here at the School of Social Work, who couldn't be here with us tonight, has identified likely mediators of its effectiveness. The dissertation of Angela Guesquire, who is here with us tonight, um, a, recent, and a recent Columbia doctoral graduate, focused on help seeking and confirmed the fact that dissemination of our clinical materials and information is the critical next step in our work. So the mission of the Center for Complicated Grief is simple. We want to improve the lives of people suffering with, with this condition. How are we going to do this? Our primary objective is, as I've said, I think, dif dissemination of knowledge. The Center has established partnerships with colleagues at Columbia, some of whom you've heard from this evening, others in New York City, elsewhere in the United States and globally in order to share information, train clinicians, and support innovative research. We've, be we've begun programs that we hope will raise awareness of CG in the population at large. We seek to reach CG sufferers as well as their friends, family members, and colleagues. We hope to make widely available our CG-related assessment and therapeutic tools and methods so that clinicians in health and mental health settings can make use of these effectively. We're beginning a project to revamp our existing website in order to utilize web-based and social media tools to disseminate information as widely and as effectively as possible. We've begun a year-long Train the Trainers program that will produce experienced clinicians <coughs> who can teach others. There are local participants in this, project, uh, in this program, as well as individuals from California, Boston, and Pennsylvania, and from Italy, Ireland, Canada, and China. We're working to develop and test curricula for graduate, postmasters, and postdoctoral education of mental health professionals. We're developing methods to provide consultation and support for researchers doing clinical research, and we're hoping to be able to develop a seed money research program to stimulate innovative projects from young investigators like Zoe. Death and loss are weighty topics, ones that most of us naturally shy away from. Sometimes when I tell my friends I work to help people who have lost loved ones and are struggling with intense, unrelenting grief, they change the subject, or they tell me they don't have much interest in this topic. That is, until they experience it. <coughs> Partly as a result of this aversion, many are caught off guard when they lose a loved one, including some of the most introspective, deep thinking, and creative people in our culture, people like Joan Didion, Megan O'Rourke, and Joyce Carol Oates. A basic assumption of our center and one that provides a guiding framework for our activities is that grief is a community affair. Megan O'Rourke has a simple, elegant way of saying this, as she has of saying most things. She writes, I believe in the importance of individuality, but in the midst of grief, I also find myself wanting connection, wanting to be reminded that the sadness I feel is not just mine, but ours. When we, in the helping professions, adopt this perspective and open our eyes to the problems of death and loss and grief, we can provide a great and needed service and simultaneously deepen our own humanity and sense of community. It is in this spirit of community that we are here tonight celebrating the launch of the Center for Complicated Grief and the reason why the Center belongs here at Columbia University School of Social Work. Thank you.